All right. So procuring cause, that's why we're here. Does anyone know what procuring cause is or what it means? The reason behind, okay, so the reason that the, the sale happened, right? Correct. That is the actual, not scientific definition, I don't think there is a scientific definition, but that's what we'll call it. The, the cause of why there was a sale. And what we wanna talk about today is number one, how you can protect yourself as being the procuring cause when working with a customer, and how you can, uh, and what the process looks like once you do have an issue, we agree there's an issue, we go ahead and file, how does that work? Um, so we'll talk about all of those steps today. First, arbitration. Arbitration is when two brokers go to the Board of Realtors together and fight over a financial dispute. And it's usually over procuring cause, but it can be over several other reasons. Procuring cause is definitely the number one, and that term is thrown around there quite a bit. Um, I do want to make sure you understand just because you show the property does not make you the procuring cause. Here are a few tips to make sure that you can protect yourself in the event you do have a dispute come up like this. First, make sure you're working with the actual buyer. What I mean by that is, if your buyer is a corporate entity, make sure you're working with the person who has the authority to make a decision. There was a very large lawsuit, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it happened as they called it the tailgate agreement. So a realtor was at a tailgate party and spoke with a representative of, I think it was FPL. And they agreed to acquire a piece of property for a, a new build out that FPL was working on. Great, handshake deal, agreed, we'll take it. They handshook on the deal and move forward. That realtor was awarded, or the broker for the realtor was awarded a few hundred thousand dollars in commissions as being the procuring cause that had that conversation and trans and agreement not been made and the handshake had not occurred, that, com that deal would not have gone through, that acquisition would not have happened, all of that caused the sale to go through and the subsequent steps after that. That was recently appealed and reversed, stating that that employee, employee of FPL didn't have the right to make that agreement. So it has to be a member of that corporation who has the power to make decisions. Okay. If you're working with a couple, a husband and wife, well, maybe not a husband and wife, a girlfriend and boyfriend, and the boyfriend purchases the property, but you were working with the girlfriend, you're not working with the buyer. If they're married, that's one thing. But if they're not, they're not. Okay. Educate the buyer on the process and what your access is. You, on what realtors do, that we all have access to the same properties. It's about working with someone you trust to guide you through the process rather than the person you trust to find the property first. Educate them on the process of getting pre-approved, of going through the mortgage process, linking them up with preferred vendors. That shows very well for you in the event of a procuring cause case. The fact that you linked them up with the title company or a lender and got them pre-approved or assisted them through that process definitely helps your case. Again, that's not a foolproof method. There is no foolproof method. Follow up frequently and consistently. So keeping in touch with your customers, not just through automated listing alerts or automated messages through your CRM system, but reaching out by phone, reaching out by text message, speaking with them on a, a personal level, not personal to that point, but personal as far as person to person communication instead of a machine doing that. Keep a timeline of your series of events, show this property, show that property, Spoke, spoke with them, followed up by email, kind of a timeline. And your CRM should do that for you as long as you're keeping and maintaining one, setting your notes and your events and updating your appointments in there. Constant personal communication, we talked about at the top, but I wanted to reiterate, not digital communication as far as automated messages and follow-ups, drip campaigns, it's about you personally reaching out. And be realistic with your buyers. What I mean by that is, not making 25 offers 50% under listing price. It's making them make realistic offers. Let's say there's a listing for 350,000 and you write up an offer for 200. And then the following day they go with another realtor and make an offer at 325. You're not gonna be the procuring cause. They will be because they got them to be realistic about the offer. 
if your offer was 324 and the next day they offer 325, you probably could be the, the, uh, the procuring cause, depending on other scenarios, but most likely yes. So that kind of helps you be realistic. Don't make a BS offer if it's not gonna go anywhere. You know it's not gonna go anywhere. Educate them on being realistic. Hello. There is no such thing as a foolproof method to prove your procuring cause. There's no security blanket. There's no foolproof protection. A letter from the buyer telling a previous agent that they're fired or they're no longer working with them is not cutting off procuring cause. That doesn't always mean that. It has to do with other factors. Exclusive buyer brokerage agreement. There are some companies that really promote and, and insist on you using one. I hate those personally. Does anyone use a buyer brokerage agreement? No? I hate them. And the thought is you're signing an agreement between the buyer and the broker that the buyer's agreeing to work with the broker for a, prop, a purchase of a property of XYZ. And the broker's agreeing to do their diligence and be honest and yada yada representing them. Okay. The only way to enforce that it has no bearing on another broker's ability to work with them. It's only the buyer's obligation. So let's say they go buy a property with ABC Realty that was subject to your exclusive buyer brokerage agreement. The only way to enforce that is not through arbitration with the other broker. We have to sue the buyer. We are not gonna sue the buyer. <laughs> um, that is really bad PR, <laughs> really bad. I'm sure all of you would not like to see us in the news for suing a buyer for a commission. <laughs> It wouldn't go well for your, for your marketing. Mm -mm. Um, the, Keller Williams is a company. I, I can't really talk about it, but that is a company that really teaches and prefers you to, to write up an exclusive buyer brokerage agreement. In my eyes, it's a scare tactic to tell your customer and a way, a tool to explain to them about loyalty. And that's really all it is. And actually enforcing it. They're not going to do it either. No, not going to sue the buyer. No, not going to. It, that's not a reputation a company wants to put out there. Right. And don't judge me for drinking out of a Zillow coffee cup today. <laughs> <laughs> um, showing the property first before another realtor comes along and shows it to them does not constitute procuring cause either. What happened between the time that you showed it and the time the other realtor showed it? What was your communication like? What was your comfort level with the buyer? What was the buyer's comfort level with you? That all comes into it. Writing the contract, writing up an offer and sending it to the buyer to sign also does not constitute procuring cause. There could be a change in the terms. It could be a change in one single date or one single number or mm. they didn't feel comfortable with how you sent it to them. They didn't want to sign electronically. They wanted to sign in person or they wanted to sign electronically but not in person. This all has to do with building the relationship with your customer, knowing them, building that comfort level to the point where it doesn't matter what property they're going to buy, they're going to buy it with you. Speaking with the listing agent, informing them, so-and-so, Jane Smith is my buyer, and they happen to go with another realtor. That doesn't protect you. A showing agreement. That's a written document signed by the buyer stating, I showed you this listing. Doesn't protect you. Wow. None of these things individually will protect you. Cumulatively, they will all add up together and help your case, but none of them are going to be, oh, well, he had a buyer brokerage agreement. That means he's, he's got the commission. That's not the way it works. Questions about any of those? I have a question about the segment before this one. You said you refer somebody to a uh, buyer brokerage agreement. Yes. Mm -hmm. I always give them choices, like I give two free choices so that they can make a choice so that I'm not pushing them and, and then they go, oh, well, you told me to do that and look what happened. That's a good point. So what's your question with that, though? Like you said, just give them that. To set them up with a lender. I didn't say set them with one lender. Oh. It's facilitating the process, really. So the question was offering one lender or one title company versus three and not being kind of the scapegoat if something goes wrong with it. I agree wholeheartedly, but you should have three good options anyways. So even two is fine. So offering up a few different options 
could be, let's say you say Wells Fargo, Chase, and the Mortgage Center, something like that. And they happen to choose one of them. It's not going to fall back on you. But the fact that you provided them with options and facilitated them taking the steps to do it helps your case a lot. A lot. It's guiding your buyer. That's educating your buyer. That's bringing them along the way. Where if you hadn't done that, they may not have gotten pre-approved. They may not have gotten pre-approved for that amount. They may not have gotten pre-approved in that time to be able to purchase that property. That's, it all kind of ties in together. In order for there to be procuring cause disputes or commission disputes or an arbitration case for us to go through, there must be an offer of compensation that we're fighting over. You know, if a, if a homeowner has their for sale by owner and they sell it to someone and you said, no, that was my buyer, where's the offer of compensation? There is none that we can go off of. So the first thing is, was there an offer of compensation in the MLS? That's the ideal scenario. Properties listed in the MLS, there's a commission offered. Property goes under contract, gets sold. There we have a number to define what we're fighting over. Second, was there, was there a verbal or written commission agreement? Let's say, go back to that for sale by owner scenario. You have a commission agreement with the seller for that prospect. He sells to the buyer, nothing happens, you didn't get your commission. We have that written commission agreement to go ahead and work with. <coughs> Let's say it's a commercial property, not on the MLS. Maybe it's on LoopNet, doesn't have an offer of compensation on it. A commission agreement is arbitrable. We can go after that commission as long as it's a verbal or written commission agreement. You have made an agreement of compensation. Verbal works too. How do you prove it? Through conversation. I mean, there's actions that follow that as well. So on April 3rd, 2019, we spoke about an offer of 3% if I procured a buyer um, for this property. Following that, I sent contact information of my buyer or I connected the two of them. You're going to have some type of chain following that. Always, always something in writing. Whether you agree to it, we're gonna make an agreement right here. Ariam, I will take a 3% commission if I sell your house, I'm gonna bring you a buyer. I'm gonna follow over the email. Per our conversation today, You've, we've agreed on a 3% commission when I procure a buyer. I will notify you by email of any buyers. Cover yourself with a chain of events. That's the idea. From before, we talked about keeping a timeline of your events or a history of your communication. That's the scenario. At the bottom, was there a verbal or written referral agreement? Referral agreements are also arbitrable. We can go after that if there was a referral agreement. Now, with the referral agreement, the important thing to remember is referrals are not agent to agent. Referrals are broker to broker. So if an agent comes and says, I'll give you 25% for working with my customer, doesn't mean anything. It has to come from the broker. Everything has to come, anything commission related has to come through the broker. So if you write a, yeah. So if you have a referral and you're gonna do it, put it in writing number one, unless it's two agents under the same broker, and then you can just do an email between the two of you and we're gonna respect that. Um, but again, put it in writing. If it's a he said, she said, that's a difficult decision and I don't wanna be in that position. I've had to do that twice and everybody, I promise you, is gonna walk away not happy. Um, that's how I know I did my job. So if it's with another company, make sure it's in writing and signed by the broker, not the agents. Yeah, we have the form. What was that? We have the forms. We do have the forms. And if you have a referral agreement to expedite things, feel free to send it to me electronically. I will simply click it and send it right back to you. Referral agreements are easy. They take no review from the compliance department. I will just sign and return. Next, let's talk about ethics, procuring cause, and morals. There's a big difference between the three of those. Our code of ethics doesn't always follow good morals. Morals don't always follow the code of ethics. Procuring cause has nothing to do with one of them. Um, so an example of someone's personal moral value rather than an ethical issue. Sally says, I would never dare work with a buyer who's been working with another realtor. It's just not something I would do. She's got herself up on a pedestal. The second one, Steven, hey, it's business. Nobody owns the buyer. Besides, he doesn't want to work with you anymore. I don't know what you did, but he's my buyer now. 
What's the difference between the two of these ethically? According to our code of ethics, is there a difference between what Stephen and Sally do? No, there's not. Morally, yes. Okay. Who is going to make more money in this business? Stephen. 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 He's a little bit more aggressive. Is there something wrong with Stephen or Sally's position? Personally, you might feel a different way. But let's say that scenario came to you. You got a call from a buyer and said, yeah, I've been working with Susan. Um, I just don't think she's doing the right job for us. I just, there's something about her. Would you mind showing us homes? What would you say to that? Yes. Felice will take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would too, 100%. Now, what is your obligation according to our code of ethics if you have that conversation? That's one thing, don't say crap about the other realtor. What, you have one obligation. Did you sign any exclusive agreement with that broker? That's the one question you have to ask. What about if you didn't sign, but you got a mortgage company that he already approved that buyer? If he got a mortgage company and was approved with that buyer, the mortgage company isn't owned by the broker, is not a part of the brokerage, it's independent, doesn't matter. However, there are other circumstances that get involved, but the point I want to get across is according to our code of ethics, your obligation is to ask, are you under any type of exclusive agreement with another broker? That's really proper language to say, but did you sign an agreement with that agent? No? Great. If they say yes, hands off. Hands off. If you, if you proceed forward after that, you're violating the code of ethics. There is a term on that buyer agreement. Do you have a copy of it? I do, okay. What's the end date on that term? May I have a copy of it, please? Make sure you operate outside the terms of that agreement. It could be a timeline. If they're really smart, agents that do those exclusive buyer brokers agreements, right, any property in Florida with a door from one to a million. <laughs> covers everything, okay? but some are very particular and specific about these properties that they list on there. They'll say Sunrise, Margate, and Coconut Creek, three bedroom up to 350, because that's what the buyer told them. Great, that's great. Okay, we're not gonna look in those cities. <laughs> or that price point. Well, you can look in those cities above that price point, or you can look in those cities for a four bedroom, or you can look outside those cities, just operating outside the exclusive agreement, okay? You can't do it because they're tied to that other brokerage. They got to go through them. Oh, well, if I said two bedrooms, you pay the There you're good. But that's splitting hairs, and we will get into a dispute because of that. So the first question is, are you under, did you sign any type of agreement with that agent? No? Great, I'd be happy to work with you. Nobody owns the buyer. It's very different on the buyer side from the seller side. Sellers sign an exclusive listing agreement to hit the market. Buyers usually don't. And especially in South Florida, rare to see an exclusive buyer brokerage agreement. I know. They're wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. That's all you have to ask. Are you working with someone else? If they say no, you've done your work. Even if they have, if they said no, you are not obligated to be an investigator and go call around every real estate company in South Florida to find out. Your obligation is to ask. That gives you reasonable belief that they're not working with another realtor. That is your obligation. Correct. Oh, you were working with someone? Okay. Did you sign any type of agreement with them? Qualifying questions. Okay. Any questions on morals versus ethics? Trying to get to the fun stuff. I have a couple scenarios. Um, commission dispute. Okay. So you were working with a buyer for three months. You showed them 35 houses because they were really particular and they happened to go under contract for one of the properties you showed them and you've been speaking to them the entire time. It just closed. You now have an issue. What would you do? Step one is call me. Call your broker. Correct. Now, what I'm, the first question I'm going to ask you is, 
run me through what happened. How'd you meet the customer? How long have you been working with them? How many properties did you show them? Was this the first property, the last property, the 22nd? Did you speak with the listing agent? Did you register through showing time? And I'm asking these questions not really to pry and justify your story. I'm prying to, to find out what kind of talking points and evidence that I would have on a claim for you. Correct, to get a true picture of what happened because I have no idea, okay? So the first thing is get your broker involved. And what a broker is going to do is contact the other broker and attempt to settle things ahead of time. I will tell you most of them don't happen. Most brokers say they're protecting their agent and they're, no, that's our commission. No, that's our commission. And they're not gonna come to an agreement. It's great if we do and avoid the entire process, but it's very, very rare. Um, I think we've only settled a couple of them out of all of the different disputes. Anyways, the second step would be, okay, do we have enough to file for arbitration? And that's when all those qualifying questions come into play. Do I believe that you have a shot? And the reason is, if I believe you have a shot, we can either resolve it in mediation in more of our favor than the other, or if we go to actual full arbitration, we have a chance to win. If we have a shot to win, I will back you 100%. No doubt about it. I love going to these. I know it's a weird thing to like, but I love going to these. I should have been an attorney in my former life. <laughs> um, because I like going to these cases. I like arguing these points. It's the closest I get to being an attorney. Thank you. Um, I'm the first person in three generations of my family not to be an attorney. So this is how I, you know, kind of connect. Um, <laughs> once we file for arbitration, the board of realtors you are a member of, who we choose to file with, um, files, a, a does a request for mediation and puts all of the brokers that are involved together. And if you are an interested party, meaning it was your deal, I will invite you to come with me. So we'll go sit there and what happens is each party tells their story of what they had happened from their side than what we had happened from our side. And the mediator tries to get both parties to make an agreement and walk away. And the mediator says the same thing I do. If everybody walks away unhappy, I did my job. Because if somebody's happy, they got what they wanted and the other side's unhappy. If they're both unhappy, they both had to sacrifice, they both had to compromise, and everybody walked away with something. Mediation is the best place to resolve this. There's a third party telling them what they think will happen in arbitration and is scaring them to the point where you could lose and get nothing. Would you like half of something or would you like nothing? You don't know. Let's say we don't resolve things in mediation, an arbitration, um, an arbitration hearing is scheduled with a panel of five brokers. Five brokers appointed by the Board of Realtors. They're all people who have been in the business forever. Um, some of them 35, 40 years. And you sit in front of them and it's like a case. It's like a court hearing. You call in witnesses. Some people have legal representation, some people don't. I will never request legal representation. Um, some people do, some people don't. You call on a witness, witness gives their testimony and leaves. The only parties that can remain in there are the brokers. So if it's your deal, you'll be called in for your testimony and you'll leave. They'll ask you questions and you'll leave. Um, the way that arbitration works, the five panel members will vote at the end, majority rules. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's 100% awarded to one side or the other. You don't get any kind of explanation of why. You just get the money goes there. That's it. The decision from the arbitration panel is final and binding. The only way to appeal that is not to appeal their decision, but to appeal the process that was taken. For example, there was a step that was missed or you weren't given a chance to give your testimony or your witness wasn't allowed to be called in. Something like that. That's due process appeal. And that's what we can do. Can't appeal the decision though. And that goes through the board of directors of your local realtor association. Any questions about that? Okay. Here are a few examples of commission disputes that come up. A change in the MLS office of compensation, meaning there was a 3% written into the MLS and you only got paid two and a half. Or there was 3% and they changed it to two and a half after you sent in your offer. Not only is that an ethical violation, but it's, uh, it's arbitrable for the additional half a percent. Mm -hmm. 
the offer of compensation is locked at the time you send your offer. So let's say I have a listing on the MLS and I drop the commission from three to two today and you send me an offer tonight. It's the lower offer. It's the lower percentage. And everything's time stamped. So the time and day that you send your email, what was the commission at that point? Even if your offer is by the phone, over the phone, you can call and make your offer over the phone and follow it up with one in writing. And the time is stamped at when you made your offer on the phone. Always email. It's timestamp. You can always pull your call logs, and that's what we discussed. But at the same point, at the same time, they're not usually thinking about it until you make an offer. So when they make an offer is when that change would come up, or the thought processes would come up for them to want to change it. Second one is procuring cause, which what is what we're discussing today. Obviously, you were working with someone that you caused the sale, and they went and they bought the house with their cousin who's a realtor who gave them back half the money. A bonus offered in the MLS. There could be a bonus that's offered and you didn't get paid it at closing. We can go after that as well. No commission paid. They just didn't pay you at all. Um, and that's more along the lines of a for sale by owner, commission agreement and off market property. And then finally a referral agreement that wasn't paid out. You referred a customer to another broker, broker closed the deal, didn't pay you because they were paying in the butt. Referral still counts. We can go after that value. Uh, go going for back it. to the buyer, not suing the buyer. How about the seller? Depending on the circumstances. So we had one scenario with a realtor who was friend, best friends with the owner for like 27 years, something like that. Um, they wrote up the listing agreement, put it on the market. Seller didn't even read the listing agreement. Hey, you're my friend for 27 years. I trust you. Just did the dude sign. Okay. The listing agent procured three buyers all at full price, but all of them had contingencies on the sale of their home. The seller didn't feel comfortable taking those. According to the exclusive listing agreement, if I procure a buyer at the price that you want to sell and the term that you want to sell, by term, I mean cash, conventional VA, FHA, I'm due my commission. No other contingencies matter. I chose not to pursue that seller. Number one, because they were friends for so long and trusted them, didn't really read through the listing agreement. And number two was the three offers all having the same contingency that I personally wouldn't want to take either. How about if the seller decided that they find a buyer, mm -hmm. they want to, like somebody has to go ahead on an option, and they go in two days later and say, uh, If a seller finds their own buyer during your listing term and just wants to cancel and doesn't want to pay you, I will definitely recommend going after that, that selling. Yes, I'm not opposed. I'm not opposed to that whatsoever. The friend, yeah, with the one, yes. I believe the friendship did end on the one I was talking about, yes. Um, it's an unfortunate circumstance and it would have been better just to, to walk on and go past. But that, it depends on the circumstances, what I'm saying. I don't mind going after a consumer if it's the right circumstances. And correct. Correct. And there's obviously legal fees that go into that and all that kind of stuff. Okay. When can you file for arbitration? Let's say I'm talking right now and you're like, damn, there's a scenario a year ago where this happened to me. Can we go after them? We can't. Our timeline, our statute is six months, 180 days. They define that as the date of closing or the date you reasonably could have known about it. But in South Florida, well, in Florida in general, really, you close on a property within a couple days, it's already appearing on the property appraiser. So really the time of closing is your stamp. 180 days from the time of closing. Because with reasonable diligence, you could have looked up the property appraiser and known if they bought that property or not. You could have searched your customer's name in BCPA and found that they bought a property. All of that kind of stuff. So it's, to, it's commonly viewed as the date of closing. In order to arbitrate, there must be an offer of compensation, like we said, the MLS, a commission agreement, a referral agreement, even a verbal offer of compensation. And bro both brokers must be members of NAR. By that, I mean a member of a local association. A commercial broker, we cannot obligate to arbitrate at our local board. Okay, we'd have to sue them separately. Um, and then final one is your broker must agree to do it because you can't. So I will tell you from past experience, if you tell me your story, 
I will give you my honest opinion as an arbitrator would see it, as an arbiter would see it, and say, okay, we have a shot, or no, we don't have a shot. I really don't see a case. Regardless of the opinion I give you, if you feel so strong that you're right and I'm wrong, I'll still file for you because I want to fight for you, okay? The cost to file is, of course, on you guys. So financially, it doesn't matter to me. I will invest my time to support you. So I will agree to do it even if I don't agree that you have a case, okay? But I will give you my opinion, and you don't go to an attorney and tell them what the law says. I've been through this, okay? So the first stage we talked about was settlement, broker to broker agreements, the benefits. Obviously it eliminates your risk of losing a case if we can settle ahead of time. It saves the cost of going into filing an arbitration. Arbitrations carry a cost of between $200 and $500 depending on your board rules. I think Miami is 500 and Fort Lauderdale Palm Beach is 350, something along those lines, okay? In order to start the file, we have to pay that. So you better believe it. Um, second, a third, it saves the time of creating the filing, which takes, it's a lot of paperwork, and the process of waiting. From the time we file, it might be a month before they schedule the mediation hearing. And then that's two weeks later. Okay, we didn't resolve in mediation. We're probably gonna go another three to five weeks before the arbitration set. So you're pretty close to three months out at this point from when you even started to decide to file. It's not fresh in your head anymore. You're not as passionate about it. It takes time to go attend the mediations, to attend the hearings, things like that. So obviously settling ahead of time is a best case scenario. And the fourth one, I got this from the director of legal resources from Florida Realtors, but I really don't agree with this one. Preserves relationships. If I call another broker and I have to be aggressive to get them to agree or to get them to negotiate, I don't see that as preserving any relationship whatsoever. Uh, but it does preserve a relationship with a consumer because you better believe that somebody's going to drag the consumer into this. If someone was working with Kathy and then you go over and started working with Arium, Ariam got paid on the commission. Kathy wants to file for procuring cause. You better believe Ariam's gonna call me in as a witness because I'm the most important testimony. What happened between me and her? What happened between me and him? That's the most powerful one. And a member of the public should never be drawn into this kind of stuff. It doesn't look good for either company or either realtor. That's cutting your relationship right there. Make sense? The second step would be mediation. Um, you go to a table, you sit down with a third party, and they pretty much just try and get you to agree on something, okay? The nice part about mediation is you would, you would have filed for arbitration ahead of this in order for mediation to be scheduled, but the nice part about mediation is the filing fees refunded. If you come to an agreement at mediation, you get your money back. They say, thank you for resolving things ahead of time, here you go. And whatever the award is, the award is. And that's agreed upon by both parties. I have walked into a mediation where I thought, for sure we're gonna lose this case. For sure, we're screwed, agent messed up, we're gonna end up having to eat it. I walk in and the mediator interpreted it in a different way. I mean, I looked at the facts and I saw what was there and I said, well, if you look at a black and white, we're wrong, he's right, we're gonna have to pay him his commission. We're gonna have to pay him the extra point and a half that he was looking for. And the mediator looked at it in a different way. And the other broker is, was not familiar with the process and said something that she responded, the mediator responded and said, you know what, if this goes to arbitration, that right there, you're gonna lose. And I just shut my mouth. We ended up winning the whole thing. We got Sam Petty, it was great. Great, I walked out, I was partying in the car, it was great. Um, anyhow, so it's less costly uh, when you resolve things. It happens faster because the mediation is the first thing that's set. You don't have to wait for the arbitration case to come up. You don't have to go attend the hearing. Um, mediation is voluntary. Let's say the other broker does not wish to attend. They don't have to. They don't have to do a mediation. They can go straight to arbitration. Nine times out of 10, you will, uh, 99 times out of 100, you will go through a mediation ahead of time. 
when there's an agreement at mediation, it's usually like a 50-50 chop or a 60-40 chop, something like that, to avoid having to go to the next step. And I said this twice, I'll say it again. At mediation, if you resolve it, nobody walks away happy. Everybody had to give in something. Both parties believe they deserve the entire thing. So when you come to an agreement mediation, everybody's unhappy, but everybody walks away with something. Okay? A lot of times it's the customer playing both parties. And it's on us to be selfless in that sense and realize that and come to an agreement to avoid anybody being hurt and wasting time in the long run, yourselves and the other party. When you do get to arbitration, 99 times out of 100, one side will win the full amount. And what they're looking for, the professional standards panel that hears arbitrations, they're looking for an uninterrupted series of events that lead to a sale. And we're going to go through some explanation with that. Okay. So you kind of understand how to look at it. Uh, do, do, do. We'll go back to that. We'll go back to that. No, we won't go back to that. Okay. So evidence, how they're going to look at things. This is the kind of evidence that we can put together to support your claim. A timeline of your events of what happened. I met Susie Q. She contacted me through my website, inquiring about this property. We spoke, we met, we got her pre-approved through my preferred lenders. Um, we went out and looked at 12 houses this day, four houses the next day, three houses the following week. We talked on the phone three times a week, things like that. A timeline of a series of events. We eventually made an offer. The offer was rejected. Three days later, she made an offer with her cousin. That one was accepted with the same terms as my offer. Timeline of events of what happened. Okay. Copies of showing history. Copies of how many properties you've shown. Maybe your request through showing time. That's why I love showing time. It keeps it for you. Or put it into your CRM, a record that you can print out at a later date. A copy of all your communication with the buyer, your text messages, your emails, all of that stuff, your phone call history, all goes into supporting your claim. Your chain of communication with the listing agent of the property they ended up buying, your request to show, your organization with them in setting up a time, your following up after the fact, here's the feedback, here's what my customer said, hey, thinking about an offer, hey, I've got an offer for you. All of that kind of stuff supports your claim. A copy of any offer you submitted on their behalf, not only for the subject property, but all of the offers you submitted. It all supports your claim. Anything else that could be relevant to your relationship with either the property or the party, the party meaning the consumer that ended up buying it, anything that you feel is relevant could be, could be applied, could be put in. Maybe you went to their daughter's graduation and they invited you because you had a relationship with them. Put that in there. It's all relevant to your relationship with the consumer. Ethical violations can be used in the hearing, can be used as evidence. However, it won't be a basis for their decision. Meaning, let's say they violated, the other party violated my exclusive buyer brokerage agreement because they didn't even ask if they had one. That's an ethical violation and helps your case, but because they didn't ask, won't decide in your favor. That's not a flat line, okay? Now I'll go back. Again, there is no flat rule of thumb. The arbitration panel is not looking for one item that defines whether one party gets it or the other. They're looking for a cumulative chain of events that led to the actual sale going through. They cannot take a decision from a prior case. Well, this sounds like ABC versus FGH Realty where the buyer did this and the other agent did this. There's no precedence. There's no explanation of why someone was awarded. There's no precedence on decisions on awards of finance, financial award. So every case is looked at independently and whether they have a buyer brokerage agreement, you're a single agent, you're a transaction broker, none of that really matters. It does not determine or go, or go towards procuring cause. Okay. I want to go through some scenarios because that's going to clarify what I'm talking about for you. So one scenario of procuring cause is when your buyer stops, uh, stops working with you and they start working with someone else. This is on the side of the fault of the broker. I have no political affiliation. I just, when I searched bye-bye on Google, that's the first image that came up. Um, so 
due to the broker's unresponsiveness or not acting when the buyer requested them to act. The buyer believes the broker wasn't interested in working with them and has moved on. That's broker abandonment. So the broker has decided they're not gonna put forth as much effort. I've shown this person 37 homes, I'm getting frustrated. Oh, she wanted to make an offer? Screw her, I'll wait till tomorrow. Broker abandonment. That's you leaving them alone and not acting as they have requested you to do, okay? That's them calling you and you're not responding, not returning their phone call. Goes back to the number one rule, answer your damn phone, okay? The buyer has stopped responding. You're communicating, you're doing everything that you need to, you've shown them properties, you've been respectful, you've helped educate them along the process and they just stopped answering you. That's buyer estrangement. The question is, did the broker do anything engage in conduct or fail to act when they were requested to do so that caused the, pur the purchaser to move on that caused them to lose faith in you one i've seen in the past is when a male realtor makes advances on a female customer and the female customer no longer feels comfortable yeah happens more than you think um causing the purchaser to feel uncomfortable and move on and work with someone else that's a scenario Buyer has requested that they make an offer at 275,000 and they say, I'm not gonna do that unless you wanna write it for 290. Buyer can move on, okay? These are all, these are all kind of examples. Um, buyers requested to see the property and the agent's out of town and not available for two weeks. Buyer can move on, it's buyer estrangement. Failure to follow instructions, not understanding the buyer's needs, showing them 12 places that are 55 plus when they're 43 and are looking for a single family home, <laughs> not following through with what the requests are, okay? Last one, personal conflicts, talks about that first scenario I told you, comes up a lot. Um, I did have one come up where the buyer, the, the agent was a male and the female customer was making advances to the realtor. That's a funny scenario. So I said, did you close the deal? He said, yeah, I made the sale. Happened with you? <laughs> no, I'm talking about the reverse. Let's say you were a man. The buyer was making advances to you. Shit, Anna, I would too. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so how did, how did you react with that? The buyer made advances at you. And you stopped working with them. You stopped. You did the thing you had a buyer making advances and you stopped um i've only had that problem once um, <laughs> uh, but he was really nice no, <laughs> um, so there's different ways to handle that i mean you can completely cut off if you're completely uncomfortable if you're married bring your husband with you bring your husband with you to the showings yeah If you're uncomfortable, like showing late, yeah. Safety is a big concern in our industry. Huge. Right. Right. It's, safety is a big issue in our industry. So showing properties late at night on your own is always a concern. Going to a remote property challenge of doing here in South Florida. But regardless, if you're uncomfortable, if a buyer's made a personal comment that you're uncomfortable with, bring someone else with you. Maybe your husband, maybe another coworker. Invite another agent. I guarantee that there will be a realtor in this office that is more than willing to go with you. Especially if it's a concern for your safety, we're more than willing to go with you. I did. I did. And that it happens frequently. There was a she was murdered, right? No, no, the one that was the most time the guy tried to Oh. I don't want to repeat that on the recording. Um but yeah, safety's a concern. So whether it's you don't have to be a slave to the buyer's schedule and a slave to the buyer saying whatever they want to you. If you're uncomfortable, refer them out, cut them off or bring in someone that helps you feel more comfortable while you're around them. Because on the phone, text message, email, they can make a comment, but you can ignore it and you're not in immediate danger.
when you're out with someone in person, it's a concern, okay? Maybe bring in a male agent to work with you and go do the showings, something like that. Have them do the showings and not you. I'm busy, but I'm gonna have my partner go, something like that, okay? So let's look at, here's, here's a scenario of two, two realtors working with the same buyer on the same property. We're gonna go through and I wanna get your kind of feeling on who you think is the procuring cause of this sale. So John showed various properties, agent on the left is John, showed various properties over a six month period. John connected the buyer with lenders and gave them property information. John submitted two failed offers that were rejected. Buyer said, this is exhausting, I'm gonna take a break, let's regroup. John continues to send listings for several months, even though the buyer does not respond to his emails or open his email. John finds out the buyer signed a contract five days after his last offer was rejected. So when they said they wanted to take a break to regroup, that really meant we want to take a break from you and move to someone else. Jane. Jane met the buyers through a friend that referred him to Jane the day after John's last offer was rejected. So what happened? They lost faith in John because of what? Possibly unrealistic offers, possibly miseducation. Maybe not making the bad offers, but not educating the buyers on the process or how to be aggressive enough to get accepted. The buyer told Jane he was disappointed in John and did not want to work with him anymore. After several offers and counter offers, Jane was finally able to negotiate an offer the seller would accept on the same property that John was working on. Property closes 30 days later. Who do you think is procuring cause on this one? Well, same property, I'd say Jane. You've got two Janes? John, Jane. Jane? Undecided. John? John? So we have a split room. And that's what procuring cause is. There's no definite answer. You're going to get... So John was working with them. John showed a bunch of properties, right? Various properties over six months. He was working with these people. In, yes. Call the listing agent and saw it himself. They did their job. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. unfortunately, yeah, that's, that's one of those circumstances where when you're out of town, what could you have done to do differently? Ask another agent to take your, take your place while you're gone. Well, it should be on the MLS, but that agent should have had somebody in their, in their place. Regardless, you should have had written, written, written requests to show the place. And while you were unavailable, have somebody else. So the consumer wants to see it today, but you're not available until tomorrow. If they really want to see it today, they're not just going to take your answer of we have to wait till tomorrow because you're busy. They're going to find someone else to get it to you. Just like when you, when someone calls off of a realtor.com or a Zillow listing, if you don't answer, they're not going to wait for you to get back to them. They're going to call the next person. It's the same thing. It's on demand. Ethically, they did their job. 
ethically they did their job and they're under the impression that they were not working with someone else. Put yourself in their shoes, okay? You have somebody call you on your listing, you just came back from out of town, you have somebody call you on your listing and says, I'd like to see it today. Can I see it? Absolutely. Are you working with an agent? No, I'm not. What are you thinking in your mind? Double lender, right? So that, it, it is upsetting, but the buyer is the one who did that. But at the same time, you had not built enough of a relationship with them that they didn't stick by you. Buyers are liars. Correct. The buyer didn't feel indebted to you. Well, I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> let's let's get let's get back to our topic. All of them. That's always a concern. A buyer can always acquire the information direct. They can go online and do it. They don't have to go to the building. They can find that stuff online too. In today's day and age, we're not the gatekeepers of information anymore. Hundred percent. Agreed. So in this scenario, we have a split room of John versus Jane. I don't know how the arbitration panel would have interpreted it. I can see both arguments. John worked with these buyers for six months. He helped get them pre-approved. He submitted a few offers and the buyer didn't say they were dissatisfied with his service. The buyer just said, hey, we're gonna take a break for a little bit. He showed them the unit and he continued to send them more properties that could interest them along the way. Okay, Jane comes in, they have a different relationship with Jane, but Jane does get them to be a little bit more aggressive. She gets them to come up on their price, to get come up on their terms for those offers that were rejected. So let's say Jane was not in the picture. Would they have bought that property with John? No. Let's say John was not in the picture and Jane came in and said, or they were referred to Jane, and Jane took that referral, went out, whether she showed the property or not, made a more aggressive offer and got it accepted. Could that sale have still gone through? Yes. So without John, it still could have gone through with Jane. Without Jane, John wasn't closing on that deal. So in my opinion, Jane is a procuring cause. But there's five different panel members with five different opinions, and we had six in this room and a split room of three and three. It's even more in the favor of Jane. If the Jane had asked if they were working with someone and they said no, it's even more in Jane's favor. Buyers are liars. They're going to say no. Just ask the question. They don't. You don't have to. You don't have to. Correct. So in John's case, let's go back. Let's go back to buyer estrangement here. Not Donald Trump. Here we go. Um, did the broker fail to do something in here? Did John fail to do something on their behalf? Was it failing the ed to educate the buyers on unrealistic offers? Possibly. Was it a personal conflict? Possibly. They lost faith in him. He made offers that he supported them. They didn't feel that it was them. And they made a more realistic offer with Jane and got it accepted. Procuring cause is a really weird thing. It's really weird. Let's say I'm working with Arion for six months. Your broker, John, right now. Okay, we've worked for six months. We've made a couple offers, including today. I asked you to write up an offer today at 300,000 on a 329 listing, okay? I go out for dinner with my wife tonight, date night. The table next to me hears my conversation. There's a realtor at that table. And they come over and say, you know, I know that property or I know that building. 320 is not gonna cut it. You gotta go full price. That's the only way you're gonna get that place or even have a shot. You might even wanna go over, ask, over asking price. I end up writing an offer with that realtor for asking price. I get it accepted and I close. Who's the procuring cause there? Um, 
Or this same day to have make a decision. So it might be the first. <laughs> so I did see a case go through. Not the exact scenario, but they went to a party, talked to someone else. Instead of making an offer ten percent below ask, they made an offer at asking price with an escalation clause. Okay. They got that offer accepted, fifteen hundred dollars over asking price because of their escalation clause. Had that not happened, that sale was not getting accepted. That purchase was not getting accepted. If I made an offer ten percent under list, I wasn't getting the property. When you say escalation. It's crazy, isn't it? So if your buyer asks you to write an offer now, do it now. Don't wait. An escalation clause is, a, is are terms that are written into the additional terms that say the buyer will escalate their offer to $1,000 over the highest offer received. In order for this to take effect, the seller must provide a copy of the first page of the contract showing the higher purchase price. Escalation clauses are sick. They're awesome. Yeah. Nobody uses them. They're a little scary, and your buyer has to be comfortable with you. It could get crazy. Let's say you go into a bidding war. There's a property at 200000 Okay, and you say fifteen hundred over. Right? You could also cap it in your in your escalation clause. Final sales price not to exceed two thirty five. Something like that. Escalation clause. We there was some conversation about this on the Facebook group. Love that. Just people going back and forth about it. Some people had not heard of it before. Some people have. It's a really effective negotiation tool. If you know you're getting into a multiple offer situation, do that. There will not be a multiple offer situation. Yours will always be on top. What's the most negative thing you have than the most the the scariest part of an escalation clause is the listing agent not understanding it and shying away from it because they don't get it. Just like we talked in this room, how many of you have heard of an escalation clause before? One. Okay. One out of six. One out of seven. Okay. You had? Okay. So one out of seven. So imagine you make seven offers and only one listing agent knows about it. That's going to be an issue. So what's the negative that you have to be There's no negative. As long if you don't write the complete terms of the escalation clause, then you could run into issues. Let's say you don't put a cap on the sales price. Let's say you don't require the seller to provide you with another bona fide offer as proof. They could just say correct. And there's no requirement for them to show you. You want to say they'll escalate X amount up to X price, and seller will provide a copy of the offer that this clause to come into play. Yes. They kind of they kind of are giving a number. They're putting an offer, a written offer on the first page. You're putting a sales price. But in the additional terms you're writing, buyer will increase their offer to five hundred dollars over the highest. In case there's a higher offer, or they get a cash offer, or they get a couple full prices, and are only going to negotiate with those instead of yours. Always put you to the top of the stack. It's how bad does your buyer want it? One. Number two, do they trust you with what you're telling them? And number three, do they get it? Did you explain it in a way that they get it? It's a really interesting thing. Creating animals over here. All right. Um, once you're at an arbitration case, you argue your side. They argue the other side. The award is given by a majority vote of the panel. There's no explanation of why. They just say that broker wins and they get this much. That's it. Or that broker wins and they're going to keep the full commission. Something like that. It's always one way or the other, okay? There is no split pots in arbitrations, all one side or the other. So you have to really, really believe that you're correct. There's no such thing as a slam dunk in arbitrations because you're getting five opinions and you saw just from the one case we talked about that we were split as a room. So a panel of five brokers that have been in the business forever, they're going to be split decisions. You're loving something back there right now. It's, it's, it's really neat. Yes. Jonathan. One second. We have one question here and then I'll get you. 
Okay. I'm Jane. Okay. Let's say I'm Jane, and the the person comes to me and says, "I don't want to work with John. You know, he put in two contracts for me. I don't think he's being aggressive enough." How many realtors would say, "Okay, you know, reach out to John and say, let's let's share this." So let's go back to that scenario with the two people on the phone. You've got Stephen that was on the right side. Oh, I showed you all my cases. Um, so the scenario is how many agents will go back and say, go back to John and try and work with him again? This one. That's the difference between Stephen and Sally. Sally will say, I can't work with you or let me talk to John and I'll get back in with him, something like that. What is John gonna do? One of two things. He's either going to agree or he's gonna call the buyers and bitch at them. Damn it, I just cursed. He's gonna call the buyers and give them a hard time. You don't think, what did I do wrong? You're going with someone else. That's not how this works. And guess what? They're not gonna call you back either. You just shot yourself in the foot. Um, in my opinion, once you ask, are you under an agreement with them? You move on. Yeah, you move on. Are you, have you already been working with a realtor? Yes. Okay. Did you sign any type of agreement with them? No. Good. Move on. Work with them. Okay. Um, we had a question at home. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Jonathan. It's Felice. Back to the escalation clause. Um, if you do include that on your contract, what does the other agent have the seller agent have to show you to prove that there was um, a better offer than yours? Depends, that's a good question. And it depends on what you write into that clause itself. Usually how I've seen it written is requesting a copy of the full offer. Okay. A full bona fide offer made by another buyer crossing out any personal identifiable information, like crossing out their name. Okay crossing out their address listed on the final signature page, things like that. Okay. Um, blocking that. For me, all I really care about is the first and second page. The first page talks about pricing. The second page talks about financing. That's really all I care about seeing. And that's okay. going to be everything that I need to know that will bring the escalation clause into play. Possibly. That's possible. So full contract, great scenario. Uh, the first couple pages may not suffice. There could be a buyer's credit or a seller's concession to the buyer at uh, on the additional terms or in the closing cost section. So a full copy of the contract. And it all depends on how you write the terms into the additional terms. If you say seller must provide buyer in order to, in order to take this clause into play or to take this clause into effect, seller shall provide a copy of a fully, a fully signed or a buyer signed offer contract blocking out any personal identifiable information something like that within 24 mm -hmm. hours of notification some stuff along those lines the more you write in there in details the better off you are going to be in protections right all right yeah thank you let's do some scenarios these are going to be fun okay at home feel free to vote okay scenario one the lovebirds. Sally is contacted by the girlfriend of the prospective buyer who is currently out of the country. Sally spends several weeks showing property to the girlfriend who finally falls in love with one of the properties. The boyfriend has a friend who is an attorney and real estate licensee and also a realtor member. So the boyfriend contacts that friend as soon as he returns to the country. The friend writes the offer on the property that Sally showed the girlfriend and collects that commission. Who is the procuring cause? You say Sally. The friend. The friend. The girlfriend got nothing to do with the girlfriend. Correct. So you this is this goes this goes back to making sure that you're working with the actual buyer. Yeah. The buyer was the boyfriend, Sally was the girlfriend. If they bought it together, that's another story. If Sally was the purchaser, that's another story. 
the buyer was the boyfriend. So you were working with a completely separate party. Mm. He does not, is not entitled to this commission. It does go to the attorney real estate licensee. And you better believe that everybody you're working with knows someone else who is a realtor. Or yeah. Right? 183,000 members in Florida. <laughs> yeah, in Florida. Florida realtors. No. No, that's 183 that are members of boards, members of MLSs. Well, they're active enough to be able to search and list. You had, you had a scenario? I remember. I remember. More often than not, it's not worth going after it on a rental. It's a lot of work and you have the filing fees and stuff like that. It's not worth it. And I think in your case, it was an apartment complex anyways. So we couldn't do arbitration. We would have to fit civilly sue them. So it, it, at that point, not worth it. No, and understandably so. Case number two, broker Bob has a listing on a short sale and procures buyer Todd, whose offer doesn't make it through the short sale maze in time for foreclosure. The property is foreclosed on, the listing broker is replaced by another listing broker, Jane, who now represents the bank. Naturally, the buyer still wants the house. As soon as the buyer, the property goes back on the market, the buyer submits the offer, which is accepted and closes. Broker Bob files for arbitration as Todd was his buyer that he found for this property. What will happen with Broker Bob's case? It's gonna be dismissed. There was no offer of compensation from the bank, but let's say there was an offer of compensation. Let's say it was listed on the MLS and Todd still went through and bought this. Does Bob still have a claim? Yes. It depends on, on various things, but without Bob, would this buyer still have bought the property? He bought it without him. It went on the market as a bank owned property. He procured the buyer, he did it under a short sale. Regardless, the offer of compensation that broker Bob had was from the prior seller before he was foreclosed on. That's the offer of compensation. There was no offer of compensation from broker Jane to broker Bob. Gotcha. See how procuring cause is crazy. Mm. Mm. True. The element of proof is on the person who's claiming that they didn't get it. Not on the person who did. Okay. Case. I skipped case three. Case four. Okay. Case four. It's my money and I want it now. JG Wentworth up in the house. <laughs> George places a sale listing in the MLS and includes in the broker remarks bonus to selling agent of $5,000 for full price offer with a closing date prior to July 31st. The sale goes through at 5,000 under listing price and closes prior to July 31st on the 30th. The bonus is not paid at closing and the listing broker says it didn't qualify. Selling broker Jonathan and his realtor associate file an arbitration request for the $5,000 bonus. Are broker Jonathan and the realtor entitled to the bonus? No. I'm hearing lots of no's. I got one no at home. I got four in here. What do you think? Kathy? What do you think? She, wait, wait, all right, all right, wait, wait. She's reading. I want her opinion on this. We got to close out the room. So far, we're 100% saying no, it doesn't qualify. Waiting for one more answer and then we'll move it. Hmm. Any other opinions at home? Well, it's under it's under listing price, and it um, says it had to be full price offer, so it doesn't sound like he would be qualified. Okay, what do you think? No, not you. I know what you think. Okay, 
You're all wrong. Mm. So I'll give you an explanation. NAR's rules and guidelines state that no offer of compensation can have stipulations. For example, you can't put a 3% offer of commission in the MLS if it's full price. Oh. You're 3% upon the sales price. A bonus is interpreted as an offer of compensation. Offers of compensations cannot have stipulations. So you could write in the MLS, bonus of $50,000 for buyers with the name that start with the letter A from the United States and speak Spanish and are Jewish and live within five miles currently of the Episcopalian church in Boca Raton. And guess what? It's going to apply to everybody. Doesn't matter. You cannot make a stipulation on an offer of compensation. So there's, by the way, everybody gets that wrong. So, you know, correct. So guess what? A bonus is a bonus regardless of what else it says, if it's in there when you make your offer. So let's say the offer was accepted $40,000, right? You're still getting one? Yes. Yes, you would still get it. Even if you had offered, even if they agreed to a distressed sale, $50,000 under list price, and you closed in December, doesn't matter. Correct. And it's, remember, everything's time stamped to the date, the time and day that you make your offer. So let's say it's in there, but you know for a fact that bonus is outdated because we're in September and July is way gone, okay? If it's in there when you make your offer, I don't care what the dates and the numbers are in there, you're due that bonus. We will go after it and we're gonna get it. Promise you that one, okay? So the important lesson from this is not on the buyer side of when you can make sure you get it, it's on the listing side because that's when it's gonna really hurt you. If you offer a bonus, when it no longer applies, take it out, get it off the MLS, because that is your locked in legal obligation. Well, we gotta be careful too, if we got a seller saying, I just got an offer a farm. Perfect, good. Yes, and that is a big issue. So let's say you write in the listing agreement with the seller, or you make an agreement with the seller to, incre in, to include an offer of $5,000 bonus for full price offers, okay? If it's not a full price offer, that seller's not gonna wanna pay you and you're gonna have to pay the other side. So you have to manage that relationship, okay? I requested that Florida Realtors adds terminologies into the listing agreement. I've been asking for this for 18 months um, to add terminology into the listing agreement that states what the bonus and that it can't have stipulations, things like that. If you're offering a bonus, you're offering a bonus, period. If it's in the MLS, an offer of compensation cannot have stipulations. It's not a violation for them to put the stipulations in there, but they still have to pay you. Okay? Yeah, but even if it's after July 31st, it's still going to be ineffective. So in, once the offer's in, it's locked. You can't change it. So let's say in this case, it, say, it didn't state full price offer and just said $5,000 bonus with closing date prior to July 31st. When you hit July 1st, I would take that out because you're not going to get many offers that come in with less than a 30-day closing. So take that out because it's no longer going to apply. And that's how you kind of cover yourself with the seller. The full price offer part of it, you can't really get around, but the dates you can. You can't hold them for the dates with the stipulation, but there's a time when you can take it out because it's no longer logical, okay? I love that one. I love the bonus one. I, I, I teach continuing education, you get, most of you know that, at many different locations, and every time I bring up bonuses and offers of compensation, the entire room gets it wrong. I love it. Case number five. Now this is a real life scenario. This happens frequently, okay? Not this exact terms, but yes. Uh, it's a little small, I'll read it for you. Um, listing broker Lucy entered a hot listing into the MLS. Actually, excuse me, she listed a hot listing. She asked her assistant to enter the listing into the MLS for her and gave her assistant a copy of the listing agreement to do so. Her assistant misread the listing agreement and entered the total commission into the MLS cooperating broker field. 
Lucy realized what happened after receiving an offer, but before the seller accepted, and called Bobby, the cooperating broker, to explain the error. Bobby rejected the explanation of a mistake and said if he did not receive the full amount as stated in the MLS, he would file for arbitration. The deal closed and Bobby filed at his local association. Does Bobby have a valid claim? What if it's the full commission? It's 6% listed as co-op compensation offered to transaction broker. The full commission. Can he still take the full commission and they get nothing? Yes, I think. It's black and white right there. It's very clear. That was the compensation offer. You can hold them liable to it. What wow. the panel and what the board will not do is an exorbitant amount. For example, I saw a typo instead of 5%, it was 50%. <laughs> you can't reasonably expect that the seller would pay you 50% of the proceeds as a commission. Okay, so that is one that they would probably not enforce to 50%, but they would enforce to 5%, things like that. Completely depends on your agreement. Completely depends on your agreement. It could be, could be a referral fee. So the question was, if you are listing a property and you bring a co-agent to list it with you, how much are they due? They're due whatever you guys agreed upon. Excuse me, whatever you, your broker and their broker agreed upon, actually. If it's inside the same company, it's whatever you guys agreed upon. Correct. And that's a referral usually, but you can do co-listings on the MLS as well. Two brokers from different companies listing on the MLS. You can do that as well. When you're entering it, you put a co-selling agent, you just put in their ID. On a listing agreement, it has both brokers, both brokerages on it. No, anything, anything. It's not common though. Like you don't see it often and why? Why would you? I would never want to work with another agent from another company on it. Yeah, with the same office, definitely. I would want a referral. If I'm working with a, an agent from an outside company, it's, hey, you're either going to take it and pay me a referral or I'm going to take it and pay you a referral. What do you want to do? That's working with someone while you're gone, things like that. Yes. Put it into an email so you have it written what your agreement is. Hey, per our conversation, here's the agreement. Please respond yes so we have the agreement in writing. That's all you need. Because in the end, whether you put it in writing or not, the final decision is with the broker. And every time that's come up, nobody's happy. I don't like making those decisions. But will if I have to. So lessons learned from all of this. Your commission's never safe. We're all doomed. The world's ending. But bonuses are good. And escalation clauses are good. Um, no, lessons learned. Keep a record of your interactions in writing with your consumers. Don't do everything by phone. Follow it up with a text. Follow it up with an email so you have it in writing to refer back to. Try and use showing time to track your showings that you're bringing a buyer through and the data oriented. You can make notes. You can text through showing time. You can text the listing agent through showing time. Or have a CRM where you're putting all your data into. Save all of your documents and communication for at least 180 days. If it's less than six months old, keep it because it could come back to protect you. Follow up consistently and frequently with personal communication. That means reaching out, not sending automated messages. Discuss any circumstances of disputes with your broker. Especially if you're working with a buyer and another agent calls you and says, that was my buyer, what are you doing, you snake. Get your broker involved at that point. I'm gonna tell you what you can do and what you cannot do to keep yourself out of having a dispute like this. We had an issue last month. A location realtor had the listing. A, an offer was made by a buyer with another agency. I'm gonna call it uh, Generation 27, the brokerage. Um, so Generation 27 agent made an offer on the listing. It was accepted. They renegotiated had an executed offer, went to inspections. The realtor said the buyer wants a $30,000 credit for all the work. Seller said, oh no, um, deal canceled. 
supposedly the agent and the buyer were very good friends. Anyways, a week later, location listing agent gets a call from another location realtor and says, I had this buyer who got, who got me through Zillow. I've been showing them a few houses this week and one I sent them, they said they had seen already with a different agent. Actually, they had an accepted offer, but something didn't work out in the negotiations. Would your seller still be open to selling to them? Yeah, absolutely. My seller will still work with them. They were just unreasonable on the inspections. I said, okay, I'm going to write up an offer. Location buyer's agent <clears throat> wrote an offer with a zero inspection period because they had already done their inspections, right? Wrote an offer with a zero inspection period. It was accepted and it closed. During the process, Generation 27's broker contacted all agents involved screaming foul play. Um, both location agents did the smart thing. Shut their mouths, stop answering, Call your broker. Here are the circumstances. Here's what happened. What do we do? Coaching them through that, there is no dispute on the table and there will be no dispute on the table. Closed, they both got their commissions. We all moved on with our lives, okay? We were definitely the procuring cause. And what the explanation was from the consumer to the buyer's agent, the new buyer's agent, was that they didn't request 30,000 in credit. That was their friend doing it on their behalf, trying to fight for them when they didn't request it. They didn't say they wanted to cancel the deal. In fact, their friend told them the seller wasn't willing to do it and wanted to cancel. So that was the cut right there. So they no longer trusted their friend. They're no longer friends with their friend. And they found a new realtor who made an aggressive offer and had the conversation, the negotiation to get it done for them. That was the cut procuring cause right there. Okay, so if you have something you feel is a conflict, call, email, Facebook message, smoke signals, whatever you got to do, okay? A really good way is posting on like the Facebook group and tagging me. I always seem to respond to those very quickly. Um, it's that little annoying number on my app. Uh, trust experience. If you call and go through the scenario and I give you my opinion, it's like going to the doctor and saying, yes, I have a broken leg, or yes, I, need, I have high blood pressure when the doctor hasn't even examined you yet. You need to allow experience and knowledge to give you some education and not spin your wheels because you're going to get frustrated in the end. I will tell you, we currently have four arbitration cases out right now in a couple different boards, and two of them I feel strong about. Two of them I told them not to file, but I did it anyways because they wanted me to, and we're going to lose. It's just a matter of... It comes up more than you would think, but to be honest with you, we're doing on average about 425 transactions a month. And for us to have four pending right now is nothing. Not even. That's 1% if it all happened in one month, but this is over a series of months. So it's even smaller. It's not very common, okay? Um, it's about 75% sales, 25% rentals. You never know. That's why you always want to keep your records. You always want to follow up, always want to build the relationship. It's not about selling this property at 123 Main Street. It's about selling the relationship you have with your consumer and that you're in their corner. Okay. And the last recommendation lesson is don't make typos on commissions in the MLS. It can cost you a lot of money. I know it did, it did cost one of our realtors $5,500. He entered a listing into the MLS and thought the compensation offered a transaction broker was if he was on both sides. So it was a 6% listing, but he agreed to take five if he had both sides. So he put buyer's agent, 3%, transaction broker, 5%, non-representative, 3%. Everybody's a transaction broker unless otherwise specified. So when they made their offer, they closed, called us up and said, hey, you shorted us 2%. We negotiated, he ended up paying $5,500 instead of the full extra 2%, but that was broker to broker settlement. And that did not preserve a relationship. I hate that broker. <laughs> if you have a question, you're not really sure how to perceive that, um, and you don't feel like bothering me, or you don't think it's worthy, or you don't wanna to get to that point, we do have a free benefit, the legal hotline. They're really good, I love calling them. You just have to know the question to ask them. You can't say, what do I do? 
you have to ask a specific question. Here are the circumstances. Here's what's happening right now. Is this legal? Do I have a claim? Those kind of things. And they will answer those questions. If you leave it open-ended, they're not going to answer your question. They're going to say, well, that's a, that's a difficult question. I can't really answer that. <sighs> things like that. You have to ask the right question. Um, so in addition to the legal hotline, has anyone called the tech helpline? Tech helpline is sick. I love them. They manage form simplicity. They manage the, uh, the, the workings and the functions behind form simplicity, but they will help you with anything and everything that has a plug. They're amazing. They'll remote into your cell phone if you're having issues changing your email or programming your email. They'll remote into your computer if you can't set up your printer. Like they will, they're your geek squad on, on, on call. They're amazing. And they're open seven days a week now. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's shorter hours on Saturdays and Sundays, but they're still open. And they're answer very quickly. They're super good. Let's say you're thinking about buying a printer or you're thinking about getting a new phone, Samsung versus Apple. They'll give you an opinion. They're, they're your in-house 16 year old. <laughs> the tech helpline. Just Google Florida Realtors Tech Helpline. It's free. They'll stay on the phone with you for an hour and a half. It's unreal. We were having issues with everything, anything with technology. It's amazing. So the, the, the neat thing with, that, with their branding changeover, we were having issues with logos appearing for some associations and not others. So I called them. And they helped me connect all of our various accounts from various MLSs into one and copy the logo over across all of them for me. Awesome. Love them. Anyways. Okay. So now you know how to protect yourself a little bit and how to look at it from a different angle um, and also what to do when a buyer calls you. Okay. So get out there and make some money. Okay. Any questions? Oh, do I have a question on here? Nope, friend. Thank you, Jonathan. You're very welcome. Thanks for attending.